Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm just looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, I think you're going to like what we do here. My guest today is Michael Oliver of Momentum Structural Analysis. And we spend a lot of time today talking about the debt crisis in the US, the equity market, the consolidation of value into so few names and what that means in a literal one falls and they all fall scenario in the S&P. We cover the commodity sector from a variety of angles. I know you're going to like this one. Michael is brilliant. I always learn a ton when I speak with him. Quick announcement. If you are trying to build a portfolio in the commodity sector, then check out thecommodityuniversity.com. This is a one-stop shop for anybody beginning to build a portfolio in the decade of commodities. So check out thecommodityuniversity.com for more. Here is Michael Oliver. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with Michael Oliver. Michael, it's great to have you back on the program. I appreciate you making the time. Glad to be here, Jay. Let's start with the uh, a big picture question. What do you feel the public or the media is misunderstanding in the markets right now? Well, this is true with the Fed too. Okay, what they're misunderstanding in in my view is, and this is, we've been saying this for over a year now, uh, well over a year. Uh, we called the top in the S and P in February 2022, and the top in Nasdaq in January 2022. And since then, had you gotten out there, you wouldn't have missed a thing. Okay except this teasing rally. Now, the, the problem is that during this teasing, what we call a counter trend rally, ever since last year's lows in the stock market, everybody's been focused on data points, meaning current reality. Okay. The fact is that when big bear markets get going, usually the data points follow the market, not the other way around. Whereas the market doesn't get smacked in the face with six months of bad data points and then go down. It's usually the other way around. Okay, that's step one. Step two is this is if you stand back and look at it, and I mean literally look at the price charts, go back to 23 to 29 bull market, Dow Jones. Look at the bull market that peaked in the 1970s, that puked in the late 1974. Okay. Go back and look at the dot com peak. Look at the 2007 peak and measure those highs. How many multiples in price gain did the SP produce to get to those highs? Usually it was double, sometimes a triple or so, okay? And usually the bull markets lasted a handful of years, you know, from 2002 to low to the 2007 high, for example, seven years, five years, excuse me, uh, about that many years for the dot-com bubble, okay? And even in 2029, you'd come up from a low in 1923, so six years. The bull market we just had, which was sponsored by the central bank, both through massive liquidity flows and free money lasted 12 years. Okay, so it's one, it's older than the, any other bull market we had, and it's far larger in multiples. S&P went up sevenfold, NASDAQ 100 went up 16 fold. Okay, now you say, oh, it's just because everything's real good and you know, all, the, all the data points are good for each company and all that stuff. Well, uh, Look at M2 during that time, and you'll see it skyrocket, more so than it ever has any decade-to-decade -decade increase. Okay. And we had free money. Now, we know that's not the real price of money, basically. Free Fed funds rate being a, a flat on the mat for about 10 of those 12 years. Yeah. So that induced what? That induced error on the part of individuals, families, corporations. One of the key financial factors that you interplay with other factors in, in making a decision, whether to buy a house, buy property, build a factory, add, add workers, et cetera, et cetera, is the price of money. And if you're given false data and a false pricing of money for that many years, many, many errors or decisions were based upon that, which are now ripped asunder. And suddenly you realize, oh, that, isn't, that wasn't a realistic component of my thought process. It was totally delusional. And so it's going to upset a lot of micro and macro factors that you can't even name. There's so many of them. I mean, each and every family has an impact, companies, municipal governments, et cetera. So there's this, it's like ripping a bandage off of a wound and it, having it ooze, okay, <laughs> literally. And the data points are going to come because there's embedded errors there for many, many years. 
and many multiples. It's like being on drugs for a dozen years and having suddenly the needle yanked out. Yeah, the Fed induced it, Fed took it away. So we have a massive bubble to break. Never before in US stock market history have we had a comparable bubble. Therefore, our expectations are it will be horrendous in terms of its real world impact, not just on people that own stocks, but on the everyday guy. Uh, and that is not being factored in. Everybody's looking at, oh, unemployment this month. You know, of course, it, those numbers are distorted anyway, uh, or, or any other data point. Powell cites those data points. That's not the reality that we're facing. So walking through these previous cycles, I agree with you. And I have the same question. It's, you know, what's different this time? Why did this bull market run so much further? Why were the multiples of gain so much higher? You point to an increase in money supply and the abundance of essentially free debt, which allows people to just kind of spend recklessly, buy recklessly, borrow recklessly, all this stuff, because it appears in that moment that there's zero consequence to leverage. Um, now, where would you point to, where is the fracture line right now? Or can you identify one? I mean, as you mentioned, there's sort of vulnerable spots all through, you know, uh, the consumer base and all, all through the, the markets. Where where are the fault lines that you're most focused on right now? Because I could say, okay, rates go up, you know, consumers get squeezed, can't make basic things like credit card payments, loan payments mortgages. So they look for liquidity at any price. You talked about the S&P and, you know, it's consolidated into what, five names now make up 24% of the, the whole yeah. value of the exchange. And, 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 about, and about twice that percent within the NASDAQ 100. Th those same right. stocks are twice yeah. that way. Yeah. That, you, just cited, like a... you just cited all the things that are going to come undone. Okay. It's okay. The area we're most focused on right now is and, and we think the stock market is now rolling over to commence its next leg down, which will be more painful and more obvious than was the 2022 drop. Okay. We're not looking so much at the S&P, although we do measure it meticulously and the NASDAQ 100. But like you said, they're highly distorted indices, more so than they've ever been in history because they're five stocks. You know, essentially answer the whole game. In fact, if you took those five stocks, you wouldn't have a S&P chart like you have now. You know, the recovery oh. would have been lame. Okay. We suggest that you punch up on your screen an XLF chart. That's the financial sector ETF. And look at what it's done since 2022. And uh, this includes banks, but it's not solely banks. There's a bank ETFs out there. And we know what they did. They collapsed through the 2022 price lows. As we'd say, when they had their peak early this year, they were looking better than the S&P. We put out a reports, two reports in late January this year, warning there's a bank ambush coming. And we didn't know what, what bank or what the story would be, you know, not fundamentally, just we could tell it in the charts. And sure enough, the banks effectively crashed. Now, what that did to the broad financial sector is represented by the XLF, is it put it back down to its 2022 price lows, which for the XLF are around $31 on that ETF. We're trading in the 31s yesterday, okay? We're sort of back on the mat again. It dropped there in March of this year, XLF did, back to the 2022 lows because of the bank crash. Then it bounced, and now you're back there again. And we're looking at the broad financial sector now for hemorrhaging, not just the banks. Uh, I think that Powell and Yellen, who will never express this because it would express panic, and they don't want to do that would also indicate a sense of failure on their part. The big banks, the top 10, don't look good at all. In fact, if you look at Citicorp or Bank of America, Citicorp made a monthly close last month that happened to be its lowest monthly close in seven years. One of the top 10 banks, no headlines, just the lowest monthly close in seven years since 2016. They're making lower price levels now, Bank of America and Citicorp, and even some of the other banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, are starting to break in ways that if you even just looked at their price chart, you would say something's wrong here. So rather than look at the S&P or Apple or Microsoft, look at the financial sector. Almost the precise technical situation occurred in late 2007. Now in late 2007, the S&P 500 was punched up into the upper 1500s. 
Uh, we had a target zone we expressed in late 2006. We said that next year we're going to top the market. We think it'll top between 1550 and 1600. Well, in September, October, finally, of 2007, there was a final rally in the S&P that got it up over 1550 and into early October. Now, what happened that month was the Fed actually cut rates. So that last upside spike to a marginal new high by the S&P occurred when the Fed not only ceased their rate rises, which had been underway for several years, but they actually cut rates. And the market peaked. You could have sold that rate cut and you would have almost nailed the high in the S&P. But at the same time the S&P was beating its chest in the 1500s and the upper 1500s, like nothing's wrong. If you looked at the financial sector, it was melting and melting and melting. The two charts were totally divergent. Something was wrong with the financial sector. It knew it, despite the fact that in mid-2007, Bernanke came out and declared, there's no real estate or mortgage problem. So everybody should be comfortable, right? Okay. The financial sector was melting constantly. And so back then it would have paid good to pay a good it would have been good to pay attention to the financial sector not the s p we think that's the same case right now um watch the financial sector there's also some other sectors that are very interesting that most people aren't looking at because they feel so comfy and it's our assumption that when you break for example the healthcare sector it comprises 13 plus percent of the s p 500. It's about to blow out right now at the current price level. If it closed the month here, it would break through its 36 month average where you say, well, so what? It has held that average for 10 years. Every pullback gets near that average or touches it and explodes. Now you've melted through it. Nobody's noticing. And yet it's one of the happiest sectors up there because its price chart has gone sideways for the last two years, not really dropped much. And I think it's about to ambush people. So what we're watching are things that the public's not watching. I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. I'm Jay Martin, and this is the Commodity University. Yeah, now when I look at the XLF chart, I just pulled it up. You know, what you see is kind of like a, not, not a capitulation, but like a slow, organized tumble since July. Is that how you, you know? It's so on, we, we, our phrase is it's on the mat. And it's on the oh. mat too many times. You just keep coming back down here and coming back down here. Now, if you look at Citicorp and Bank of America, you'll see they're not on the mat. They've mm -hmm. oozed through the mat. Okay. And those are too big to fail banks. So I'm sure the Fed behind the scenes, is very, very concerned about that, as is Yellen, uh, even though Powell won't utter a word about it, because if he did, it would be panic. Right. So where does this put you in the, I have to ask then, where does this put you in the in the rate debate? You know, there's obviously two camps. There's the the higher for longer, and the pivot is yeah. near, and like six it's months. Over. <laughs> it's over. There's no more rate rises. Okay, that's one. Okay. Yeah. Confident. Okay. Why? Because couple reasons, but the main reason right now is that the, the bond market crashed, okay? Bond market made a low last October and then had a nice rally. In fact, we, had the, we, we got bearish on bonds in October of 2020, and they started to crash at that point, started to come down hard, not crash, excuse me. They stopped in October of 2022 and made a low and rebounded nicely. We thought that rally, that bounce, we, we sort of defined where we thought it would come from, and it came from right around that level. The T-bonds, 30-year bonds, and TLT, for example, the F of long-dated bonds, both bounced from that low and sustained their rally until March. Felt comfy. No, no, you know, wasn't, wasn't damaging to anybody. But then they started to roll over again, and about uh, six weeks ago, we said, there's going to be a nuke here. This is going to be a nuke event. And sure enough, not only did the bonds drop back to the 2022 price lows, but they blew them out and they did it in crash like manner, meaning the price charts, even dailies were like gapping down. You know, it didn't even look like a bond market. Now, here we're talking about the United States government debt market. 
you know, the most core market to Yellen and to Powell that can be, you know, they don't care what happens to NVIDIA, but, you know, you crash their bond market and they got a problem. Yeah. Problem is uh, Yellen, for example, last year, before that October low last year, expressed concern about the illiquidity, quote unquote, of the T-bond market. We, I watched very carefully in this recent crash, and she didn't open her mouth and use that term again because she knew if she did, it would in, further enhance the collapse. And so she and Powell were dead quiet until last week. Powell made a statement on the last Thursday, said, we're going to have to let it play out, the bond crash. He didn't call it a crash, of course. He says, we'll just have to let it play out. Yeah, right. Uh, I strongly suspect that they had been intervening for the last week or so to try to halt the decline, nighttime trading desks, you know what I mean? Uh, and especially on Monday's low, we spiked down again and they veed out of there. T-Bonds had a three point rally in several hours, which definitely looked to me like, you know, of the intervention. It's also our view that the T-Bonds probably have, are bottoming. Now you think, well, that'd be good for the stock market. It wasn't back in 2007. Bond prices rallied as the stock market collapsed for those two years. But the bond market is one, it's technically oversold. It looks like it could make a V bottom. But I think the bottom is only something that lasts for maybe a quarter or so. But it clearly ventilates that market to the upside. It's probably going to be the result of one, it's technically oversold, massively so. It has very good momentum dynamics to go up with. I Meaning when we look at the momentum charts of the bond market in TLT, we see the sort of what we call trend structures that are pending, not far overhead. That if you get just a little bit of a rally going, you can start breaking out. Now, you don't see this on the price chart, but you do on momentum. I think the bond rally will be caused by one, Fed intervention, unspoken, and two, some large asset managers, portfolio managers, who are finally going to go back to the 40%, you know, 60 40 rule. Bonds have been a terrible place to be for a couple of years. Last year, they were disastrous. They were down over 30%, while s and is down 20-something. So they were not a good balance point. But I think they are now, and I think a large portfolio managers will make a shift from a bearish stance, many of them got bearish late, to, hey, you know, maybe this is safe now. Because I, they, I think they also have a sense of what I do, and that is that the central bank is not going to let this go any further. They're not going to let it, quote, play out. And I think well, Ackman last week, or early this week, made a statement to that effect that he thought uh, he, he'd been bearish, but he thinks uh, maybe not anymore. And I think you're going to get a lot of large portfolio managers moving assets from that 60% stock positions to 40% bonds because they, if you watch the stock market behavior, it's not looking good, both on price, but especially on momentum. And if that encourages further asset reallocation, then I think some of that's going to go to the bonds. And because they're oversold, you could get a nice rally there. What's interesting is that it's coincident with gold. Now, in history, T-bond price direction or yield direction does not correlate well to gold. So anybody who goes back in the past and says, well, you know, you got rising rates, gold goes down, it's not true. Okay, uh, The correlation is a coin toss at best. But right now, the technical behavior of the T-bond market, TLT, and gold are almost an overlay, with one exception. We've been watching since March that both have been coming down, and we said bonds are going to crash, but gold's not. Gold bottomed three weeks ago and rallied $200, just about. Silver rallied $4, 10 trading days. T-bonds didn't. So the correlation they've had recently of looking the same, both going down with the potential to turn up. Gold is led, and I think T-bonds are now going to follow. And so for a while longer, I think you're going to get the situation where gold rises and so do T-bonds, meaning yields drop. Don't expect that to continue, though. T-bond rally is not a long-term thing. It's a counter-trend rally, but it could be significant. So what does this tell you about the, like, I want to step back now, Michael, and and understand the the big picture capital flows over the next decade. You know, what are the major shifts in investor sentiment that you would expect? Like, if we think for what the what the market's going to look like in the year twenty thirty, right? Where has capital flown? Where has it fled? Right? And what are the big shifts that we'll have witnessed 
Okay. One, I tend to think that what's about to unfold is largely going to unfold in the next year. There was 90% of it could unfold that quickly. Uh, we have, because of the nature of the beast that they've strangled, the dozen year bubble, the biggest bubble ever. So when it comes unwound and investors finally realize that it's come unwound, as a few asset managers already have spoken their doubts about the uh, stability of the stock market, despite the recent recovery. Uh, once that reality hits, the stock market's going to get clobbered. Now, I'm not going to argue it's going down 80% or something. NASDAQ 100 went down 82% from 2000 to 2002. Dot-com break. Yeah. S&P went down 50. Normally, the S&P has 50% drops. Okay. But what I'm talking about is not so much the percent drop, but probably the things that are associated with it in real life. Family problems, uh, mortgage payments, uh, rent costs, uh, relative commodity prices to your real your income, your real income. Okay, measured you know against the decay in the dollar. Um, that those things will hit in a way that maybe even the drop in the S and P won't fully explain. And I don't think this is necessarily the drop last years. Most bear markets in the stock market last a couple of years. 2007 to 2009, 2000 to 2002, uh, 1929 to 1932, okay? They're usually two or three years, and they get their job done. Uh, so I wouldn't expect much more than that. The other issue, though, is once that happens, do you turn around and have a bull market again? Everybody assumes that. See, they look at 2002 and say, oh, it turned back up. 2009, oh, it turned back up. The devastation could be so deep that it might be more like 1929 to 32. It took two decades for the Dow to go back to its 29 high. It took 1953 before it finally reachieved its 1929 high. So you might be facing something like that. The chief beneficiary of this is going to be gold and gold related. Gold, silver, and the gold miners. Uh, though the miners definitely lag gold at times to where they feel like, you know, who wants to own them? Uh, and silver lags. We measure, in fact, I just did a study over the weekend and I shared it with my fellow analysts uh, of the ratio of the, the relationship between silver price and gold price expressed as a percent. In other words, what percent of gold price is silver price expressed as a percent? And if you plot that, you can see that we've got a, what I would call a major basing level in the spread such that it won't take much rise relative silver relative to gold right now to start it blowing through the roof, meaning where silver vastly outpaces gold. And what I found that was so interesting is quite often this shift favoring silver comes late in a bull trend. And it comes at the phase in the bull trend where most of the dynamics occur. Like it occurred mostly in mid-79 to early 1980. That was the tail end of that gold bull market that had been underway since the 1976 low to the 1980 high. Most of the price gains in silver and gold occurred literally in the final several quarters of that bull market, which actually, if you look back, began in 1970s. Gold was about 30 something bucks, went up to about 200, pulled back 50% and then launched again. So that was like a decade old bull trend. Right. The next bull trend was the 2000 low, around $250 gold, that went to 1920 That took, what, 10, 11 years. Well, if you look at our bull market, it's already eight years old. We bottomed in late 2015, around $1,000 gold, $1,050. Okay, we've doubled. So the gain has not been meteoric. It's been fairly steady if you look at it. Stand back and look at it monthly. It's not as bad looking as a lot of people think. And now we're pressing at the highs again. We think what gold does in the next year and what silver does in the next year, and maybe even less time than that, could be so dramatic, especially if we see that silver spread break out versus gold, meaning the relative performance of silver across certain levels that we've defined. Right now, for example, silver is about one point, is below 1.2% of the price of gold. You divide okay. silver into gold. Okay. You get up over 1.3%. It's not asking a lot. And we think the launch begins. And at that point, we think not only will the silver 
outpace gold again. And quite often it's qu- very dramatic, but it's also fairly quick. It doesn't take years. Once that spread breaks out, it usually gets its job done within several quarters. And with that, you get a price surge. It is awesome. So that's what we're watching right now. And I think what's going to happen because of the broken bubble is that the central bank has to go back to do what they were made to do. And that is defend government debt at all costs, print money. And when they conceive with their silly laid debt lag data points that the bubble is really breaking, then they'll have to come back in and do what they did in the COVID situation in March of 2020, inject massive amounts of liquidity. They even bought ETFs back then. So I think the reversal in part of the Fed is probably underway. It's unstated, but it's underway. And I think if you break the stock market a bit more, like another 5% or so, S&P we're talking about, I think at that point, the Fed's going to start fully explaining that there's no more rate rises and maybe even talking about rate cuts. Beneficiary, gold. Okay. Okay, so uh, to, to back up a minute, a couple of things you mentioned, there's going to be some, in the way this hits consumers, you talked about raw material costs relative to income, right? So commodity costs relative to income, mortgage costs relative to income. So, you know, I, I tend to think we're, we're in the decade of, of commodities, right? This is a good decade to be a commodity investor, but the way the commodity market works in, in, in my experience is sort of like segmented, like l- lumber will run, then then it cools off, you know? Uranium's running now. It's it's going to get overbought and cool off. Energy's run. It's cooled off. It's running again. You know, live cattle futures have just actually been pretty strong for three years straight. But you know, there's two factors at play. Is there not, Michael? There's the big picture trend, which is what you're discussing. But then traders get involved, right, and add all this additional volatility to the price movements. And so you get things. You know, that's why you get these dramatic runs and these dramatic pullbacks which can signal to investors that the bull market's over when in reality, it's just traders have gotten a bit too aggressive and now the market's pulling back a little bit. Does that concept make sense? And how do you manage your emotional state? How do you manage your portfolio through those volatile rushes and pullbacks and maintain your conviction in the big picture trend when the short-term price movement's so unpredictable? Well, we think that the, the commodity boom started in October of 2020. We we put out a report that said commodity explosion about to occur and exploded. It went from roughly around the price of 70 for the Bloomberg Commodity Index up to 140. So it doubled. In fact, it peaked a few weeks after the Ukraine-Russia war began. Everybody wanted to blame the big commodity boom on the Russia invasion of Ukraine, yet the whole bull market had already occurred before that even happened. In fact, once the invasion really occurred, Commodities peaked and started to correct. And they've been correcting from 140 intramonth high back in in March of 2020 to a recent low around 100. Right now we're trading in the low 100s. So I think we're bottoming. Bloomberg, I think, is bottoming after its first bull leg. I think you just saw the first bull leg that peaked in 2020. uh, 2022, excuse me. (laughs) And we've had the corrective pullback. I think we're going to have another leg up. Uh, energy already participated in that to some extent. We took crude oil from the 60s up to 95. We thought there might be problems around 95 to 100, and sure enough, there were, and we pulled back into the 80s now. But we're watching the food commodities in particular, grains especially. They've had a harder pullback, and we think they're set for another leg up. And so the next leg in commodities probably is going to be led by food. We think more so grains, especially. Now, like you said, cattle's had a hell of a move. Okay, uh, and I wouldn't count on cattle continuing. You know, it's it's it priced itself at new highs. But you got to think about this as an investor or an asset manager. If you look at the components of the stock market that are commodity related, you know, mining companies, uh, agricultural related companies, fertilizer companies, things that are not stock market connected, they're commodity connected. They didn't go up with the stock market. They, they're not correlated to the S and P very well. Uh, XLE, for example, the energy sector ETF, no correlation at all to the S&P, especially for for five or six years of the bull market that S&P had. It, XLE was going down. Okay. Asset managers realize this. Now, if there's a new money flow coming, a new liquidity flow, because the Fed panics about certain assets cracking and declining sharply, uh, municipal bonds, their own bonds, the stock market, pension funds, et cetera. 
And they put a flow of liquidity into the system again, big time. Asset managers ultimately determine where that goes. And quite often the Fed will do that, increase liquidity flow, and it won't go where they wanted it to go. Asset managers instead will allocate it to something else that they perceive to be lower risk, greater opportunity. And right now, I think that they see commodities in that category. A lot of asset managers do and have expressed such. So if you break, start to break the stock market now and help induce the Fed liquidity flows again, I think those flows are going to go into commodities. Now, think about this. Bloomberg Commodity Index was 230. Again, we're in the low 100s right now. 230 back in 2008 and had a rally in 2011 up to 170 something. So we're trading at half or two thirds the price of where we were several years ago. So in relative terms to where commodities were in the past de decade to 15 years, they're still very, very cheap just on a price basis. And I think that will help induce money flow there. So Again, a weakening stock market might actually help commodities, which is the opposite of what most people think, because they think, well, if you're going to have a, a recession or a depression about that, uh, that's going to hurt commodities. Not given the price level they're at, and two, their relative price level as an asset category to the stock market makes them attractive, and the money yeah. flows have to go somewhere. And you know what I've I've been thinking about lately is the demand destruction doesn't usually occur nearly to the extent that we feel it will in a crisis. Like I was looking at oil consumption globally, for example, over the last 15 years, because, you know, the, the counter argument to commodities is exactly what you said. We're going to enter some kind of globally coordinated recession and this is going to destroy demand. So prices will fall accordingly. But, you know, 2008, great financial crisis, global oil demand dropped by slightly over 1%. And just wow. for a year, just for <laughs> okay. a year, yeah. you know, if you look, if you look at the 10 year trend, you don't even notice it. It, it yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's very flat up and to the right. So, okay. So I'm with you on the commodity front. I just have to ask, do you watch, are you thinking about the defense sector at all right now, just given the geopolitical instabilities and our, our seeming inability to produce enough shells right now for the, the war on a couple of fronts that we're supporting. Do you watch that sector or not so much? No, right? I don't. I have not updated that lately. And I probably need to do that because I know there's been a lot of uh, even congressmen buying <laughs> yeah. people in the con Senate and Congress uh, buying defense stocks. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, like Eisenhower said, the military industrial complex. Uh, I would bet that it's going to go down with the stock market, maybe to a lesser extent, maybe with some fitful rallies here and there, but I wouldn't trust it. No, I wouldn't. Right. Um, period. No, I would, I would look elsewhere. It is part of the stock market. It has tended to move with it and therefore it will go down with it despite these potential events. Yeah. Um, so okay. I, yeah, no, the, the one correlate that I watch there is, you know, the, the U S is stating they're going to try to ramp up production of shells, for example, to a thousand, sorry, a hundred thousand shells per month by 2025. They currently produce around 28,000 shells per month. Ukraine is currently firing about four to 7,000 per day. So you get your calculator out and you're like, we need to ramp up production okay. dramatically. And I just think, you know, what's the demand that's going to put back to the raw materials, right? We need the ingredients to produce anything ties me back to the commodity sector. So, so setting up right now, you're, you're looking at the food sector, grains, especially that's really interesting to me. Um, and I think like 25% of grain production globally comes from Russia and Ukraine. If I've got that right. Yeah. My yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we've had a good crop this year. So, you know, that helped depress prices of uh, the U.S. crop. But remember, this is not a used to be when I was first in the commodity markets in the 70s. I got hired by Hutton. Uh, U.S. crop was it. Everybody was focused on that. But that's not the case anymore. It's a global production. And I think that's why the Chinese, for example, uh, they're not trying to spy on our bases. They're trying to have global agricultural production capabilities. And so yeah. they're trying to buy property around the world. So they have about, so if there's a drought in China, there's, they, you know, they get crops in South America, maybe in the U S wherever. So uh, they're making the right move because it is global production. And if you have a balanced uh, portfolio of assets, uh, that's another area to look at also is agricultural land. A lot of property prices are collapsing, you know, skyscrapers and so forth, but Agricultural land is very commodity related, and that's a place to look. I think there's even an ETF for that. I forget its name, but uh, agricultural ETF uh, that buys land. Uh, but no, I, I I think that 
Yeah, and as far as the grains go, by the way, we're not bullish on them yet. We, we monitor them week by week. And yeah. we're looking, we have trigger levels. And once they get triggered, then we turn bullish. But I think they're yeah. probably going to be the leader in the next commodity up leg. Got it. That's where Got it hurts, it. food. That's yeah. where it hurts. For you know. sure. Absolutely. And then let's go back to the precious metal sector a little bit. So um, I'm kind of dumbfounded here because it seems like all the macro indicators you could expect are firing to is to some degree or another. Um, the equities haven't responded at all. I know my audience is going to want me to ask this question specifically, Michael, because I have a lot of precious metals investors that watch my show. What are your thoughts on on the the equities, the precious metals, gold, silver producers, developers right now? Yeah, uh, we monitor, for example, GDX and SIL, the, the ETFs of gold and silver miners and silver miners. So GDX also contains half dozen or so large silver miners, by the way. Uh, our opinion is last Friday's close was a breakout on monthly momentum, meaning that while gold has been in a corrective process since early this year, layered redundant declines with some lower lows, the recent low being a real plunge down to low 1800s, immediately reversed $200, shot back up again. The gold upturn is out of the way. It's done. It's turned up. Silver's at the cusp. Silver, for example, I'll, I'll just say this. You don't want to close higher than Friday's close if you're a bear. Okay, that was 3050 area. You closed above there, uh, um, excuse me, not 3050, 2350. Uh, by the way, that's what, over a $4 rally in silver in 10 days. So, you know, people don't seem impressed by silver, but uh, $4 in 10 days, uh, it made a statement there. Uh, gold, uh, 10, 12 days, uh, $200 rally. GDX from, from the 25s to over 30 recently. Okay, so, so in about a month or so, it went up $5. That's a pretty big percent when you measure it from the low of $25.50, okay? <clears throat> Last week's close on GDX was via our monthly momentum technicals, and that's where we measure price in its oscillator relationship to a three-month average. It's a fairly sizable metric. It broke out to the upside after being under pressure since early this year. So it had a good protracted corrective decline, very painful for gold, mining investors, much more than gold pullback on a percent basis. I think it's ended. I think it's turned up. Sill is just short of it. This is the silver miner ETF. It needs to get it up in the high 25s, close, close out a week. It's uh, right now either side of 25. So a little bit more. The miners will tend to be lagged to gold. We know that. There will be a point at which the spread relationship between miners and gold shifts from its underperformed status to outperform. This happened back in 2020. If you remember the March lows of 2020, the COVID lows, where there was this panic, everything panic, stock market, gold, gold miners, et cetera. We defined it as a bear trap. And GDX, when it turned from that low in March, turned up in April, May, June, July, those are the next three months, it exploded far more than gold. Its spread broke out shortly after that upturn relative to gold. And sure enough, it left the earth on a percentage basis compared to gold. Since then, the spread has erosionally declined in layers. And we can define when that turns back up. And at that point, we'd pound the table and say, not only are miners turning up, they're going to beat gold. Now, quite, quite, quite often those surges are brief, meaning they might only last six months or a year, but they can be very, very dramatic. And if there's one asset category I had to define as the most oversold, underappreciated asset, it has to be gold and silver miners, both yeah. relative to gold and relative to other stock market indexes. Uh, they're off the page. What do you think? They're going to zero. <laughs> it's, it's time to think cheap, buy cheap with expectations. And I think gold is telling you we're going back up and the miners will join. I, I tend to agree. I, I, you know, I can't time markets, but I can tell when things are cheap, you know, and I'm seeing a lot of that in the equities. Are you, would you expect any surge in M&A activity similar to maybe what we're seeing? You know, we've seen a couple of mega oil deals occur in the last couple of weeks. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Chevron bought Hess and, you know, they're, they're betting on the argument that hydrocarbons aren't going anywhere in the near future. And if you look at the central bank acquisitions of physical gold and the repatriation of that gold, you know, makes me wonder similar, makes me have similar questions. What are your thoughts? I think in the mining sector, there is a point at which, and, and I personally am going to do this, uh, shift to the junior miners. 
Okay. The junior miners, you know, you have a 50 cent junior miner goes to 10 bucks. You know, you know it's going to vastly outpace gold in the other miners at some point. Right now it's not. But we, we try to measure that relationship. And we also know that you mentioned acquisitions and so forth, where the big miners come in and just start buying, gobbling up these juniors. And yeah. you, you, if you own the juniors, you get the benefit of that. Uh, and it could be fairly dramatic. That probably won't be associated with what's about to happen in gold and silver. Okay. Uh, if we get, get silver up above Friday's close, for example, I think it could ignite pretty big. In fact, we've got some numbers. I'll, I'll throw them out for you. Uh, we get very specific with our subscribers because sometimes these numbers change a bit week by week. But in the low 25s, you see that again. Don't be shocked if you're in the mid 30s rapidly, mid to upper 30s very rapidly. Uh, you get gold through 2000. I don't see the next stopping point through even a pause until 2550 to 2600. Okay, so it could go up. But silver percentage could be enormous. The same thing will happen, I think, with the miners in this next leg up. But as far as the junior miners, I think they might be an event that is somewhat delayed. Where, yes, they'll go up with gold now and with the bigger miners. But there's a point at which suddenly investors and asset managers... And again, the miners themselves, the large miners, realize, hey, this sector's alive again. I'm going to buy some cheap assets, uh, either as an investor or a company to acquire you know, junior miners. And I think there's a point at which that recognition will occur. And again, that's probably not right now. If gold breaks out real soon, and I think it will over the idiot levels, the 2000 stuff, uh, momentum's already broken out. But the price chart is when they get excited, you're going to get a surge. I think after that first surge occurs, that's probably when you need to shift emphasis over to the juniors. Yeah. For the reasons we, we've been talking about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I'd, I'd buy into all that. You know, I'm holding a couple junior producers right now. And frankly, I'd hate for them to sell at these valuations. It's not what I want to see yet. You know, give me some time. All right. Look, Michael, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and chatting with me. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, OliverMSA.com, where we can find a lot more about what you're up to. But anywhere else we can push people today or anything you want to share on your your business and what you guys do, Michael? No, we, uh, we're technicians, but we look at price as a secondary. Most technical analysts look at price as a primary. We don't. We find that price, is, uh, price chart breakouts that anybody and everybody can see are often, eh, maybe, maybe not. 50-50 you know, sometimes or 60-40. When momentum develops trend structures, and this is what we do is we measure price in relation to a given mean, and we oscillate it. So we end up with a different looking chart than price. We look at that first and foremost. Momentum almost always will turn trend before price does. And therefore, we get a heads up that price is about to turn. If price then goes through a structure and breaks out, it's fine because momentum has validated it. But okay. momentum usually leads first. That's what our focus is. We look at all four major asset categories, stock markets, bond markets, foreign exchange, commodities with an emphasis on gold and silver. I love it. Okay. Thanks again, Michael. I appreciate it. And uh, I look Jay. forward to doing it again. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world. Commodities. No, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. From the fuel on your car to the battery in your phone, commodities are the silent engine of the global economy. It's the raw materials like oil, gold, and uranium that power our lives and could power your portfolio. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. My team and I have assembled a 10 chapter course to get you started on building your portfolio as a commodity investor. Everything you need to know to have a competitive advantage and an edge in this market, providing you with the skills to make informed decisions, unlocking investment opportunities most people don't even know exist. Jay Martin, and this is the Commodity University.
Get started today. 